Namaste everyone. I am Pratyasha and on behalf of the team of Center for Programmable Photonics Integrated Circuits and Systems or as we fondly call it CIPEX, I welcome you all to the webinar series PIX today. Today we are fortunate to have among us an eminent young researcher and entrepreneur Dr. Daniel Perej who is the CTO and co-founder of Ipronics among us to deliver the first talk. We'll be hearing about a multipurpose programmable integrated circuits from him. Now, before we start the talk, I believe introductions are in order. First, I would like to request our CTO, Mr. Solomon, to introduce our center of excellence. After that, I would like to request Professor Bijay Krishnadas to introduce our respected guests. Over to you, Mr. Solomon. Muted. Salaman, you have to unmute. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Good evening, all. So, welcome to our uh, webinar series picks today. First of all, I'd like to apologize for rescheduling this. So, what we thought is we wanted to uh, give a brief intro about our uh, journey on silicon photonics. And then uh, we'll uh, move on uh, to the talk. So here is our journey. We started our journey in 2007. Just a minute, please. So from 2007, we have demonstrated various uh, passive and active uh, photonic devices and uh, uh, we have uh, received global uh, grants also across the uh, different uh, agencies including government agencies and some honorable uh, grants includes the research for the research on the quantum photonics we got and a recent fund from Meithi government of India we got which is around 30 crores to work on the programmable photonics integrated circuits and systems and our journey continues to achieve a lot more things on the programmable as well as on the quantum photonics. This is our motto, the mission of our uh, CPIX. So here, the objective of working on this programmable photonics is understood by the global penetration, global focus, global concentration on the research on the silicon photonics and the growth and the R&D investments the, across the globe, what is planned like 3 billion uh, US dollars is planned around uh, to 2025. So understanding this, our Meiti, the Ministry of uh, uh, Electronics and Information Technology, so they have funded us uh, 30 crores with the objective of delivering microwave photonic signal processor and quantum key distribution device and quantum information processor as an industry grade R&D. So we are working towards it with a focused goal and we are uh, as joined as a team from the uh, faculty side. If you see, you ha we have the eminent professors uh, from IIT Madras. So who are working on various aspects of uh, the uh, uh, programmable photonics uh, integrated circuits and al along with the industry experts. We also have honorable collaborators across the globe uh, to uh, work on this uh, uh, silicon photonics. And we have our energetic uh, scholars, research scholars and project staff who are working towards the goal. So the objective of uh, this particular webinar series is to hear out from the global leaders, both from academic as well as from industry. So what we thought is we decided uh, to conduct this webinar series picks today and uh, hear out from the these experts. So these are the forthcoming talks for your interest to see. So uh, we uh, presently these are the people who have confirmed uh, for the next seminar webinar talks. So so uh, very interesting uh, talks are waiting for you. So if anybody who are interested to join us to collaborate with us in academic uh, as well as in the research part, please uh, connect us to, through our website 
and also uh, you can send a mail uh, to myself uh, cto at cpix.iadm.ac.in thank you so much with that would like to stop here we'd like to hear from the speaker thank you yeah uh, thank you shalaman uh, so it is our pleasure today uh, to introduce uh, dr daniel uh, who is a co-founder and cto of ipronix uh, programmable photonics that is a spin off company launched in just a couple of years ago. Uh, so they are dedicated for development of programmable photonic processor and computing devices. He leads uh, the programmable photonic research group at uh, University of Valencia. And uh, also, uh, his research activity uh, stands out in the field of programmable photonic integrated uh, photonics. Uh, which deals with invention and development of general purpose programmable photonic circuits. He also focused, uh, he not only just uh, do research in programmable photonics, he also developed hardware, developed hardware uh, including architectures uh, involving uh, improvement of components, because you know silicon photonics components are still uh, getting improved day by day, and also software advances leading to the creation of fault tolerant automated routines enabling practical programming programmable photonic ICs. And uh, in 2017, he received the uh, IEEE graduate thesis award by the IEEE Photonic Society. So you can imagine that he's a young and uh, also uh, uh, young entrepreneur and also uh, uh, taking uh, actually initiative in the new research area, relatively new research area, programmable photonic integrated circuits, but yet very promising and he will be uh, talking something, uh, some challenging aspects uh, today in front of us. And if you have any question, etc., then you can just put up your uh, questions in Q&A box at the end of the talk that will be addressed. Over to you, Dr. Daniel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vijay, for, for the introduction and also for the invitation. It is a real honor to be here to speak about programmable photonic integrity circuits. And also, I think that this talk will serve like an introduction for, for the for programmable photonics landscape, its technology, the hardware, and also the software part. So just to confirm that you can see the screen properly. Uh, yes, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, Perfect. looks all right. Okay, so let, let's just start. Um, the talk as introduced, uh, it's going to focus on programmable integrated photonics. When we refer to programmable integrated photonics, we are talking about a hardware platform. Uh, it can be, for example, a silicon photonic chip together with their control electronics, but also coming with a software layer enabling the programming of, uh, of the devices. Why is programming uh, an integrated photonic circuit interesting or what is the real motivation behind this if uh, i'm sure that most of you has been dealing with the with the workflow of a uh, photonic integrated circuit development if for example um i think that one of the key achievements uh, of the center was uh, the design of a high q sil uh, silicon print resonator so let's focus on this example uh, let's say that we were told to design a, a photonic integrity circuit serving as an infinite impulse response uh, optical filter. We have the specifications, the central wavelengths, extinction ratio, uh, insertion loss, a certain free spectral range. We are experts in silicon photonic design, so we have the background uh, and also the, the tools that are necessary to design this kind of circuits. We go for a custom design, an optical ring resonator. We design a certain cavity length, certain waveguide width, perform the analytical simulations or computational methods uh, simulation for the modes, the coupling factor that is required. And then we go for the fabrication and the packaging of the unit. If you are lucky and have a foundry in-house or access, you will be able to uh, fabricate your design, but uh, if not, it's something that even through multiple wafer runs take a lot of time and take a lot of money. We will review that later on, but the typical times are between six to uh, even 24 months. I have experienced that myself and, um, and also incorporating the packaging 
it comes with a not really cost effective solution. And then when you start measuring the designs of your filters, it seems that the filter is not actually filtering the, the targeted wavelength and also it's not uh, having the extinction ratio that we wanted it to have at the very beginning. We start measuring and some of them are slightly deviated, some of them are slightly deviating in extinction ratio, but there is a solution here that is pretty well known, that is with the incorporation of some phase actuators, typically electro-optic phase actuators, we are going to be able to move the, or to actuate the actual, the phase of the light traveling through our ring resonator. In this case, that means that if we incorporate a, uh, a phase shifter in the cavity of the ring, and also a phase shifter in this tunable, uh, in the couple, coupler element, we're going to be able to move not only the extinction ratio of the ring resonator, but also to tune it in frequency. So this idea of adding reconfigurable components adds a lot of dynamic reconfigurations uh, to the properties of the light and then to our circuits. So this is uh, what we call reconfigurable application specific photonic integrity circuits. The actuation of the light can be done through actuators. I mentioned there is a huge um, range of physical effects that we can exploit to provide this flexibility or this tunability. If we incorporate a massive number of reconfigurable phase actuators, this can be uh, from a top metal heater, top silicon heater, using the or exploiting the thermo optic effect through carrier dispersion modulators, exploiting the electro optic plasma dispersion, uh, for example, effects. There are also some novel methods like uh, liquid crystal toning, phase change materials that are gaining a lot of attention during the last five years. MEMS, the use of micromechanical um, architectures, and also employing optical methodologies to tune the, the phase of the light. Everything needs to be governed through an electronic control system, and then uh, it will provide this uh, aforementioned uh, phase tunability. So we have covered uh, one of the key motivations, which is the flexibility. Another motivation that was partially introduced is also that the current application specific um, paradigm uh, or workflow that you need to go through every time you create a new uh, photonic integrity circuit, like the one in the image, is going through the system and circuit redesign or design, going through the fabrication, test, dicing, storaging, encapsulation of the device, performing the assembly, the packaging, verifying the system through no, normally through advanced uh, photonic setups that allows the micromechanical alignment of fibers and electrical uh, electronic proofs. And then after this whole cycle that typically takes, uh, if it's if you are working with dedicated RAMs uh, between half a million and 1.5 million uh, to and, and in development time, it typically between one year and two years. Then you end up with a single purpose photonic integrity circuit that hopefully has no errors. Otherwise, you need to iterate through this uh, scheme. Then what's the proposal of uh, programmable photonics is to have something similar to what, the, uh, what we have in electronics. So having access to something like a photonic FPGA or a photonic processor that allows us to change radically the paradigm. So rather than going through the cycle before, it's just protection for an already designed, fabricated, and tested the photonic programmable device. And then being able to program it in weeks rather than a few months, as, uh, as in the previous example. And in this case, using the same platform for multiple form functionalities. So in this case, we can leverage from economies of scale. And also, it adds a lot of uh, value through the software reconfiguration. So this programmable photonic hardware can be uh, classified depending on the targeted um, applications, but also on the degree of flexibility and reconfigurability. We can start through the ones that we have already introduced, the reconfigurable application-specific photonic integrity circuits, 
For example, we saw the, uh, the example of the ring resonators, but here we have the uh, affinity impulse response filters. So typically it can be designed through a match sending interferometer. You can achieve a higher order filter if you cascade these kind of units. And the example before was an optical ring resonator. In this case, we can cascade it as well in order to increase the order of the filters. We can combine the previous two to get complex zeros and poles uh, filters like this Ramsey recon um, reconfigurable filter or this higher order uh, system. But also you can think about uh, dispersion compensation lines, uh, discrete delay lines like that you can create through the interconnection of tunable couplers and then regions with um, a thick large uh, length. Also beamforming networks, and finally multiplexers and demultiplexers. The beamforming networks can find applications in LiDAR systems, in, in front ends for antennas, but also the multiplexers are well-known devices that um, allows you to perform a spectral multiplexing of your signals in the multiplexer. If we increase the flexibility of these devices that, as you can see, integrate just Tunable couplers and phase shifters, we can have a, a different um, device configuration. This is a feed forward linear optical processor that, since um, I, I would say that it was proposed early in the, in the 90s, in, in, even in an integrated um, shape. But uh, in, during the last six to seven years, there has been a lot of demonstrations uh, of these devices, mainly employing silica on insulator, silicon on insulator, and indium phosphate, uh, and silicon nitrate, sorry. So in this case, we are talking about a combination of tunable couplers. I can make uh, a zoom here. Uh, we can see that this is a, just a combination of tunable couplers elements interconnected between them. And then through optical couplers, we can get our signals into this unit. And just through the propagation of the light through these elements, we are able to perform typically optical matrix multiplications. So what happens if, um, if we increase the complexity, the, the, the universality of our device? If we take a look on electronics, we can see that um, conventional electronic circuits beyond application specific devices or ASICs uh, are, we can find a general purpose electronic devices like the CPU, GPUs, microcontrollers in general, and on the top of them, the electronic FPGA. In this case, we are talking about a, de a device that can be programmed after fabrication to perform a wide range of different functionalities. So the idea of hyperlinks that started uh, after more than six years of research at the Photonic Research Labs in the University Polytechnic of Valencia is bringing to the market the, the photonic homologue to a general purpose photonic processor. So have the flexibility, the high, high bandwidth and low power consumption of photonics and its complementarity to electronics. The way of doing that was with the proposal uh, in the in 2015 of this idea of a reconfigurable photonic integrity circuit that is based on a reconfigurable optical core. You can see this one in the image. In this case, is the same. We are talking about the same uh, uh, element, so it's a tunable capper. But in this case, the interconnection pattern allows the feedback wire propagation of the optical signal. With this reconfigurable optical core, we can program a wide range of uh, functionalities. So let's take a look, for example, see if this is working. Okay. I will try to put it uh, later during the q &A. But basically, we can, um, we can indeed take a, a look here uh, you can see that we do, with, with this um, reconfigurable optical core, we are going to be able to, to produce a photonic integrity circuit through the reconfiguration of this, um, of this hexagonal lattice. Okay? So it's not only about um, 
the reconfigurable optical core that we will see later on as well. How can we program circuits uh, within this uh, lattice pattern? But also, we integrate in the photonic integrated circuit uh, a, di a, a different range of application specific device, like, for example, high speed modulators, high speed photo detectors, multiplexers, demultiplexers, dispersion conversations, and so on. So, reconfigurable aspects are also integrated on this, uh, on this, de on this design. The, um, as you can see, the reconfigurable optical core can be employed not only to perform uh, these uh, circuits on demand around this area, but also to provide the interconnection. For example, you can see here a yellow pattern that is interconnected one input port with this unit, and then through the circuit is connected to, in this case, to the modulator. But we can have the circuit working simultaneously on a different task, like, for example, getting the light uh, through this optical port, and then once in the circuit, performing a tunable beam splitter in this uh, programmable unit cell, and then splitting the signal into two optical ports. All right. So once we have this uh, device, uh, let's see what is really this programmable unit cell. So the basic element that we employ to perform the different uh, the, the light routing and the circuit topology design. In this case, we are seeing a basic mat sender interferometer through the activation of one of the arms. We are going to be able to change the, the splitting factor of this uh, of the signal coming through the input uh, through the upper input. In this case, we can split the signal uh, and create a crossbar switch, a bar switch, or we can achieve uh, any state that is between the zero and and the so the zero coupling and 100% coupling. So anything in between can be programmed through this uh, phase actuator. In addition, if we combine double actuation, then we are going to be able to change the phase of the optical signal traveling to, to this unit without modifying the coupling factor. So in this way, we are going to achieve optical filters to navigate. Another or alternative way of um, creating this programmable unit cell, it's through this um, dual drive directional coupler. In this case, we have input waveguide and another waveguide, and then we have two phase actuators under uh, on the top of the, of the waveguide. In this case, the phase actuators are performed in, in silicon nitride. You can find more details in this paper, but the basic idea is the same as with the mat center interferometer. In this case, you can see that as we perform the heater uh, down, then in this case, we can achieve um, a tunable coupling change between, uh, so we can suppress the signal from minus 30 and you then get the full light coming through uh, one of the ports. In addition, uh, with this image, we can see the single driving uh, behavior. But uh, with this image, we can see that if we have an interconnection between this tunable basic unit and more uh, tunable basic units or programmable unit cells, then we can achieve this uh, the, the, the phase tuning that I mentioned before. So in this case, we are seeing that, for example, in this case, that, that this was just the interconnection between the output wave guy and the input wave guy. So just a print resonator. And in this case, we can see that we can maintain the extinction ratio uh, quite constant with a, an, and achieve the full free spectral range tuning, just performing the dual driving uh, scheme. More details about the fabrication of the un of the unit and the behavior, as mentioned, can be found in this um, in this publication. In this case, we perform the interconnection of these programmable unit cells, maintaining a triangular pattern scheme. So, what is important about the pattern interconnection, and why is important to think different and additional ways of improving the programmable unit cell? The programmable unit cell basically will tell us about the scalability of the circuit. For example, in this case, we can see that actually, if we assume uh, propagation factors uh, for the waveguides 
that are around the state of the art, so let's say between 2.5 and 1.5, we can see that the Kepler insertion loss, in this case, uh, we assume a match sender interferometer with an input Kepler and output Kepler. If we assume uh, a state of the art Kepler insertion loss that are between 0 0.2 and 0 0.1, that gives us that the typical insertion loss of the programmable unit cells currently with the state of the art, it's going to be between 0 0.4 and uh, 0 0.3, if we are quite optimist. And then this will, uh, this is going to accumulate to our photonic integrity circuit. So this is one of the key motivations of continuing the explorations of an optimization of the programmable unit element. But let's talk about the interconnection. Why do we interconnect circuits using the hexagonal wave mesh? Well, um, I think it, yeah, it's about uh, in 2015 when it was uh, published uh, this square uh, pattern interconnection of uh, programmable unit cells to create these reconfigurable lattice circuits. And in parallel, we were exploring a, a similar concept, but in this case, using the hexagonal wave mesh arrangement. So, after a careful comparison of the of different interconnection patterns, you can identify that this is just the result of the interconnection nodes that you employ between uh, programmable unit cells or match and interferometers. So, depending on the interconnection node, if you use three nodes in the interconnection, you uh, it results in an hexagonal lattice uh, arrangement. If you use a six-node interconnection, it becomes a triangular one, and if you use four interconnection nodes, you get um, a square lattice mesh. So we perform in this paper the proposal of uh, this hexagonal wig mesh and the triangular wig mesh and the comparison among the different uh, circuit topologies, and it results that uh, the hexagonal wig mesh outstand the other two regarding the flexibility and versatility that you have in order to synthesize match senders or, and ring resonators and waveguides within the reconfigurable optical core. And why is this? It's because of the resolution that you can achieve when creating optical paths within these units. It's going to be double uh, the hexagonal when compared to the, to the square one and among the rest of the features, uh, the, um, the trade-offs are typically better for the hexagonal one. So once we have the, the hexagonal wig image arrangement as the optimal uh, one, uh, we need to increase the density of our circuits. Why? Because density means making your device cheaper. In the end, we are paying for area when, when we are going through lithography processes. So this is like similar to the, the, the problems or the issues that has been faced for electronics during the last decades, where they try to increase the density of the transistors in their electronic integrity circuits. In this case, it's pretty similar. What we um, demonstrated in this circuit, uh, in this uh, paper in 2019, was that um, in order to increase the density of our circuits, we can maintain the interconnection pattern, actually to three points, one, two, and three, but we can just shift all the different um, programmable unit cells in order to get this flattened uh, device, and the layout gets much more compressed. And this compression allows us to increase the density of, of these designs. We invented this uh, concept and, and patented it, um, I think, that around one or one year ago. So the same concept can be exploited for the triangular wave mesh arrangement and also for the square one. But there are alternatives uh, in order to increase the density of our circuits. In this case, we are seeing a silicon nitride uh, hexagonal wave mesh processor with uh, 40, 40 uh, programmable unit cells. And in this case, the way of increasing the density was to re-optimize 
the programmable unit cells. You are seeing here the hexagonal wig image pattern, and then the programmable unit cell here, which is actually a match generator parameter. You can find the input MMI, the output coupler, and then upper arm, lower arm. And in this case, the only difference is that we have reshaped the match and the interferometer to increase the density of the of the design on a silicon nitride uh, layer. So, in summary, for for this part of the programmable photonic hardware, what we are seeing here is a similar trend as the one that was experienced in the in the seventies, eighties, nineties, uh, with the the Moore law in electronics. There, it was said that. Uh, there is an exponential rate with the number of transistors with time. This has been like a, 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 a cycle where economies, industries, companies, and research institutes has provided a lot of advance during the last decades to increase the density and the versatility of our control electronics, our electronics. In this case, with photonics, we are on an early stage, but we already see the trend. Indeed, I have been preparing a work to be submitted quite soon, where after a careful analysis of more than 150 programmable photonic circuits, we are already appreciating the trend of the number of actuators versus time. Indeed, we can say with high confidence that um, the lowest rate that we could expect is going to be double the number of actuators of phase actuators every two months, every two years. Sorry. So that really means that photonic systems will have 10,000 actuators in less than six years. And that means that 100 actuators will be present in photonic integrated circuits in less than 10 years. So in order to make this a reality, we need to solve major bottlenecks. There are bottlenecks with the control electronics and the interfacing of photonics and electronics. There are going to be a lot of problems with the accumulated loss in our circuits, with the crosstalk, thermal crosstalk, optical crosstalk, and so on. And in order to solve this, but also coming as a challenge, is the software layer. We need to have a really powerful software layer allowing us to provide this, um, so to make these trends. And reality. So once we have reviewed the hardware part, let's take a quick look on the applications. Where are we expecting programmable photonics to be a reality in the near future? Indeed, anywhere where nowadays you can see uh, papers or even industrial products based on silicon photonics are susceptible of, of being made with programmable photonics. In addition, there are some applications like 5G, 6G, Industry 4.0, data centers, intra data centers, communications, optical neural, optical networks, software defined networks, optical sensing. So there are a lot of opportunities for programmable photonics uh, to bright. Some of them, and just focusing on, on the hardware that we mentioned before, where we have a reconfigurable optical core control units. RF interfaces, optical interfaces, and um, readouts for the control units. If we focus on optical signal processing applications, we will find that functionalities that multi channel optical filters, dispersion compensation, equalization, the smart routing, arbitrary optical beam splitting for LiDAR, beam forming network, software defined networks, and adaptive transceivers are some of the let's say optical signal processing applications that are nowadays straightforward to be performed with, uh, with a programmable photonic processor. If we jump to a different area, like for example, microwave photonics or RF photonic signal processing, we will find the same like filters, dispersion compensations, equalizers, signal generation, arbitrary waveform generation patterns, MIMO processing and radar processing as applications that again, we have all the ingredients that we require to perform these kind of applications within a photonic, a programmable photonic integrated circuit. And finally, during the last five years, there has been a, 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 a new refocus on photonic computing 
based on integrated photonic integrated circuits. And as mentioned before, we believe that ingredients are already ready to, to, be per, to perform the first proof of concept, as we are seeing in the literature, but also to start thinking about real products. So let's cover the, the third part of the talk, which is dealing with how can we really program these photonic integrated circuits? What's necessary? What has been the steps that we have been doing during the last seven years? And as mentioned by Bijoy uh, in at Ipronics during the last uh, two years. When we refer to the software layer, we are referring to uh, and a statement which is photonic will never work alone anymore. If we want these photonic integrated circuits to increase in complexity, we really need to have a software layer that is flexible enough to cope with the flexibility of our photonic integrated circuit. That means that we need a software to program, control, and optimize our photonic integrated circuits. This means that, for example, a user will not need any more to know about the physics or photonics in order to create an interconnection between two optical ports. Just a single line of code will do. That means as well that if a user needs an optical filter implementation, it just needs to provide, like for example, the input port, output port, the field spectral range of the filter, the central wavelength, and the circuit should configure itself to perform this functionality. And the same, with the application that we saw before, the optical beam splitting, being able to provide the input port, the output ports, and then the circuit will configure itself to perform the interconnection pattern and, this, and the configuration of each program organ itself. If we talk about programming photonic integrated circuits as a whole, and we review the literature, we will find that there are application specific routines that are tailored to a specific architectures and a specific applications. And we find that there are more general purpose photonic routines uh, just uh, to configure circuit, uh, circuits employing nonlinear optimization methods and minimize, minimizing the application specific cost function. In this case, we can see that the first one requires specific tailoring, require pre-calibration, but they are extremely fast and extremely optimized for a certain uh, problem. And on the other side, we will find that these are typically slower or takes some more time to convert, but we could combine these ones with the previous one to get optimized solutions for certain applications. This means that we need promo or photonic toolboxes. If we refer to the application specific routines, this is an example of a sequential algorithm that was published. Uh, well, we, we have in the literature several examples, like the, this one in 2018 and 2020, uh, where we find that this kind of sequential routines that basically interrogates the system and then uh, go through this sequential algorithm in order to configure the, the, the whole unit. In this case, you can assume that the circuit architecture must be known. And multiple, there are multiple demonstrations in the state of the art. But let's focus on the general purpose approach. In this case, we have already introduced that uh, the photonic hardware is built up with a reconfigurable optical core, high performance clocks, input outputs. And we also have high performance building blocks. This is the field program of photonic gate array introduced uh, in 2019. And uh, this comes with the control electronics that it's just a driving system to provide energy and the driving configuration of the electronic actuators, but also an optical readout system that allows us to extract and monitor the system uh, conditions and the optical signals at the perimeter of the chip. Everything is going through a logic unit or process, electronic processor that makes the decisions based on the application or the program that, that we are running. The software framework that we referred to previously is a performance estimator this means that we need to have a tool that allows us to simulate the photonic integrity circuit and also the non-ideal elements. We need also auto characterization in order to continue increasing. Could you imagine uh, characterizing manually 1,000 actuators that we mentioned that will be a reality in six years? 
that's a no-go. So we need scalable methods for this auto characterization of our photonic integrated circuit. We need also routines for the self-configuration of, of functionalities of auto-routing toolboxes, allowing us to move the signal through the circuit optimally. And then developer modes. That means that user being able to create their own functionality for providing photonic integrated circuits. So let's 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 say that we have ready a, an hexagonal wake MS circuit and we want to program it to perform the aforementioned circuits, like for example, the infinity input response filters, infinity input response filters, or the combination of ring resonators with infinity input response filters. In this case, we can see that. We could program, in principle, this uh, unit to mimic what we have in an application-specific device. You can find here the, the tunable coupler, uh, the programmable unit cells configured as a tunable coupler, combiner, it's going to be this combiner, and then you can identify the long arm here, which is basically this one with five programmable unit cells, and this short arm with one programmable unit cell. And the cascade of these ones, yes, we can mimic this circuit with this one. This circuit is programming this one. This circuit is programming this one. And this circuit is programming this one. But you can agree with me that this requires the presence of an expert or for us to have a pre configured uh, vector with the configuration of our circuit. This can be quite time consuming, sensitive to variations, and so on. So basically, the workflow will be. Okay, we have decided to create a filter. So we have a certain spectral match. And then um, we understand because we are experts that we will need a ring resonator or match generator parameters. And then we will program the circuit in order to create the, the spectral pattern. We measure the response. And if not, we can change it. This was uh, one of the early days demonstrators. In this case, we have. We did the configuration of um, a Xaura Wake MS fabricated in silicon and insulator. This was, and it is a world record uh, right now at the moment with the largest silicon photonic general purpose processor. And you can find here the implementation of a ring resonator. This is the tunable capper and the cavity that is closed with the bar state, cross, cross, bar, 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 cross, cross, bar state. And then we have another one, which is a match sending interferometer, access waveguide, tunable coupler, short arm, long arm coupler. And then in this case, we see the configuration of, um, of a match sender interferometer joined to a ring resonator. In this case, as you can find, this one is in bar state, so they are not interfering. So we have two circuits that are independent, a match sender and a ring resonator. In this case, as mentioned, this was the early days, first demonstrations of the programming of the circuit. You can find that configuration one is configuring the, the ring resonator. So in channel blue, it comes the optical ring resonator. Now we switch to, to configuration two. In this case, you can see that uh, this one is being destroyed and this one get the match and the interferometer. And now we jump to configuration three where we have, as promised, two circuits working independently. So we have the ring resonator of uh, six basic unit lengths and the match and the interferometer in the channel three. Of course, we can agree that this is time consuming, sensitive to variations and so on. So let's take a look on the software layer that we have created to automate the programming of photonic integrated circuits. I mentioned before that we can create a toolbox for the auto routing. In this case, it's just having a, uh, the wake MS arrangement, create a graph, a mathematical graph generation with the different vertex and edge. And then we will exploit mathematical functions and already built optimizers for path search algorithms in order to find the best paths solving combinational or optimum path problems. That means that we can find the best path in terms of re reduction of optical loss, best paths in terms of reduction of crosstalk, of power consumption, of performance, or footprint. 
after the final selection of the paths, we can employ data visualization tools that are also necessary to confirm the behavior of our circuit. An example of use is you can think about a circuit where you can you want to interconnect, for example, this path, and then the system identify that this one is not working properly. So this program module itself was not pro working properly. But the program can find itself the optimum path with the same length, but uh, reducing the optical loss. So we maintain the functionality and in an automated way. This is like a self-healing algorithm. So we program these kind of circuits. We perform some of the demonstrators. Uh, you can find them in the auto routing algorithm for feed programmable photoligate arrays um, paper, but also on the nature uh, communications multipurpose configuration of programmable photonic circuit. In this case, and since then, we have been growing the capabilities. You can find here real graphical tool that we incorporate in our so software tool that allows you to, uh, to find uh, alternative paths for the same interconnection patterns, not only for a small waveguide mesh arrangement, but also for medium waveguide mesh arrangement and also for large waveguide mesh arrangements, uh, adding more than uh, 197 uh, programmable unit cells. In addition, I, I, I want to say as well that uh, for this kind of circuits, uh, the algorithm was able to find more than 20,000 paths. For this one, more than 40,000 paths. And for this one, I have not performed the test, <laughs> but uh, it will grows almost exponentially. So that means that the larger the circuit, it will be more complex, of course, but it will be also exponentially more powerful. Let's take a look to another reconfiguration example, which is the self reconfiguration module. In this case, uh, it's just a close uh, a, a feedback loop where we drive the system, extract the monitor the configuration, and then uh, go through a, an optimization method that allows us to convert to the targeted operation. Like for example, this is an optical beam splitter, beam splitter where we are injecting the signal through uh, optical port 12, and then measuring the optical port at eight outputs. We can see that uh, after a few operations, the idea is that all the signal will be targeting the actual targeted value. So the results from that paper that you can find uh, in, in this one, in this jst 2 e article, uh, you can see how the cost function is being minimized and then all the targeted channels are converging successfully to the operation of minus 10 dB, which is basically coming from the one by eight division, so distribution loss, and then the, the rest of the channels are continually decreasing and being mitigated. But what, what happens if we want to perform the same uh, workflow, but for more complex structures, like for example, optical filters? What happens if I have losses in my circuit, if I have crosstalk, tuning crosstalk, and so on? In this case, uh, we apply the same algorithm to optical filter implementations. This was covered in this nature communication article. And as you can see here, we provide the system with the spectral mask and without changing the optical ports interconnection, uh, the program uh, find the best configuration of the programmable unit cells in order to match the different patterns uh, for different optical filters. In addition, we, we introduce here penalties that are beyond the state of the art, like for example, tuning crosstalk beyond 10% when normally is below 3%. And still the program was finding automatically the configuration of our system. An example of application of this is the equalization of an optical channel. You can find that due to optical losses, uh, uneven losses, optical splitters, combiners, even optical amplifiers, Normally, the optical transmission pattern across wavelengths is not uniform. That means that at the receiver of optical links, we find that the signals has been distorted in terms of amplitude. If we put a compensate an, an optical equalizer or a filter that just mimics the inverse of this um, spectral response of the channel, we can flatter again 
make flatten again the the, the receiver uh, response. So in this case, we have programmed this exam awake MS automatically to perform a port 2211 equalizer maintaining this spectral mask, as you can find here in the in the gift. After less than 1,000 operations, we already had a quite good match between this uh, channel 22 and channel 11. It's quite difficult to see from scratch and just seeing the coupling factor scheme that this is the optimal configuration, but indeed is the one that was found by the program automatically. And you can find that how these coupling factors are being modified till they achieve um, a constant or a steady state. What happens if the channel conditions change? We maintain the ports, and in this case, we are just asking the program to find a different pattern. In this case, it's just the opposite. It's the inverse V-shake. And you can find that the capping factor that was achieved at the final state is different from the previous one, and the interferences are making the, the pattern that was uh, requested. We test these two uh, examples, but also different uh, optimizers for this workflow, finding which one are performing better, which one are performing worse, and also measuring that we can achieve high, really, really high um, convergence rates. So for this, uh, for these channels, we measure more than 30 uh, examples with random phases at the very beginning. And we found some of the methods uh, achieve more than 90% of the convergence. Still, we are working on improving this and will be a continuous work, but we are already uh, in a good uh, point to provide this kind of functionality. In addition, we have extended this to complex or more scalable circuits, like for example, these medium sized circuits with more than 80 programmable unit cells. And in this case, you can find that again, after several operations, we can achieve a pattern that is really, really close to the targeted one. OK, so let's uh, let's move to the um, to, to more functionalities. In this case, we are talking about the ability of creating optical filters, but for a user that is um, not expert in, in photonics. In this case, we have created an optical and a, a specific library for a optical filters toolbox where the user just needs to provide the specs of the filter, like for example, the bandwidth, uh, uh, the bandwidth of the filter, it's going to be this one, the ripple on the pass band, the ripple on the stop band, the order of the filter, and I want my filter to be an elliptical filter. So these are well-known uh, filter shapes, like for example, the Butterworth, Cherry Chef, elliptical filters. I want it to be a, a bandpass filter. And just providing these uh, specifications, the program found find the analytical uh, through an analytical algorithm the actual phase that are required to get this signal. But of course, if you have non-ideal effects like insertion loss and even losses uh, through the different parts, if you have crosstalk, thermal crosstalk, uh, then we have um, a second phase which is an optimizer that performs few iterations to find the final convergence. In this case, we have several examples here that were published in the photonic switching and computing conference this year, that you can find that the blue line is just performing with the analytical algorithm. You can find uh, these two examples of uh, filters employed with a Ramsey, all order four, and a free spectral range of 36 uh, gigahertz. And with the, um, lower bandwidth and high bandwidth. In this case, you can find that uh, after the application of the heuristic optimizer, we improve the, the achieve, uh, improve uh, the response uh, with the orange one that is pretty, pretty close to the targeted uh, spectral trace. Another application or toolbox uh, that might be necessary, it's the optical beamforming networks. In this case, we are um, showing an example that was published in 2018, where the mesh is able to split and split and, and have a single input, different outputs. So in this case, we are creating a beam splitter 
This was measured actually through a, through a photonic integrity circuit, the one that was shown before. And this is how you will configure a larger scale wave MS arrangement in order to create, uh, for example, a one by eight beam splitter. Uh, how in this case, the system is programmed to have the same delay in all the units, but how the system can be configured to create a differential a output patterns with differential lengths of two basic unit lengths, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. So providing resolution to your beamforming network. And finally, let's cover the final application, which is photonic computing that was mentioned before. In this case, you can find in the literature uh, dozens of papers uh, talking about these feedforward interferometers that we mentioned before, basically allows a user to perform a matrix here, an optical matrix, and then through the propagation of an optical signal at the input, the user will get a, a vector output that is the result of the input vector multiplied by the matrix that is configured in this system. Because we don't have a lot of time, I cannot stop a lot, but let's cover the very basic of photonic computing. With photonic computing, we are referring to the ability of being able to put all your data on a photonic engine, being able to uh, modify not only the matrix multiplication, but also some additional things that you might need. Like for example, in the case of uh, optical neural networks, you need additional items like, for example, the activation functions that are typically non-linear. And also you need to provide uh, the system with the application uh, workflow. Like in this case, if you are familiar with, uh, for example, the field of machine learning, you can find that there are languages like Keras or TensorFlow, um, platform like Py or languages like PyTorch, where the user just performs some pre-processing and then asks the system to train itself or to perform interferences, inferences, sorry. In this case, what we are doing is, if we really want to put our data into a photonic integrated circuit, there are several ways. Some of them are described here. Like for example, you can have a, a, a laser optical source and then a one by end splitter or beam splitter and uh, being able to modulate the signal at its, um, at its output. In this case, we are using a program within itself, like for example, the match and the interferometer shown before, but you can use a variable optical attenuator or a high speed optical modulator, or you can combine these uh, programmable unit cells uh, arrangement and then read off the one by n beam splitter. When you code the signal, so the amplitude of the signal at this output is going to be the vector to be multiplied. And you can have also a spectral diversity. Like for example, rather than having n, 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 n inputs, we will have less. In this case, we have four, but we want to process simultaneously uh, four samples, like four vectors of four. In this case, we have four wavelengths. These splitters, we are coding here the first sample, the second sample, the third, and the fourth. And we employ multiplexers in order to get the signals to a photonic processor. This can be an optical neural network hardware, a reservoir computing hardware, a recurrent neural network hardware, convolutional neural networks, multilayer optical networks, and so on. Or it can be a multi a, a multi-purpose or general purpose photonic um, wave image arrangement. Then once we have processed the multiplication and the sign and the processing or the computation, then we can extract the signals. If we are employing this wavelength diversity, we need to recover the different samples to spectrally, and uh, this everything goes to the control unit. So what is really inside this element? I mentioned before that it can be a um, multiplier accumulate, like a fifth forward mesh arrangement. In this case, this is how the wagon, the hexagonal wagon mesh arrangement will configure um, a multiplier accumulator or a matrix multiplication of an eight by eight. We can also create 
uh, or, or program the circuit to perform matrix that are non-uniform, like for example, this linear matrix that it's a singular value decomposition of an input matrix and, a, a, and another matrix that all together with a diagonal matrix perform an arbitrary linear uh, matrix multiplication. This is the core of uh, optical neural networks. When we describe an optical neural networks is just the matrix multiplications defined by these weights of an input vector and this matrix. And the output will result in this layer. The, the, this layer can be multiplied again uh, by another matrix in order to get uh, a certain output. This is the, the fundamentals of uh, optical neural networks. If we take a look on, on the evolution of these um, photonic neural networks or photonic computing techniques, we will see um, with, um, with, with no problem that uh, the number of phase actuators required to perform a 16 by 16 multiplication employing a fifth forward mesh arrangement is 240. If we want to increase this number to the double, so at 32 by 32, then the number of phase actuators required on a single chip becomes close to 1,000. And if we want to perform a 64 by 64 or a 128 by 128, then we achieve numbers that are close to 16,000 actuators. According to the scaling law that I presented before, that is similar to the Moore law in, in electronics, this is about to happen between 2025 and 2035. But still, a lot of improvements in the area are required to get those metrics. And just to get you an idea, current uh, NVIDIA uh, GPUs are able to, to perform matrix multiplications of that are around this range within their, um, their core. They integrate a lot of cores and each core are, is able to, inter, uh, to perform matrix multiplications of between 128 and 256. So uh, with this, we are concluding the, the talk and I will be more than happy to provide you with all the answers to your questions. Uh, just as a wrap up message, uh, I want to conclude with uh, this message that programmable photonics, it's not an idea, a proof of concept anymore. It's a reality. There are already companies like us, like Ipronics, delivering products to the market based on programmable photonics. There are also huge opportunities for research academia uh, in order to provide improve uh, programmable photonic components, integrated optics components, um, software layers, additional functionalities to expand the number of applications where programmable photonics can make a huge impact. And also the key message that programmable photonics is not hardware anymore. It's not just photonics and electronics. It's also a it also requires a really powerful software layer that is the only way to continue with the scanning of this technology. So thank you so much for your attention and I will be happy to answer uh, your questions. That's an exciting talk with many possibilities shown. So there are several questions. Uh, uh, let's see if we can take it one by one. Uh, the first one is, uh, how do you drive the large number of tunable basic units? Uh, is a driver circuit off chip like an FPGA, or do you use multi current source, multi channel current source, or is it all monolithically integrated? Yeah, so thank, thank you for the question. <clears throat> it, it, it's a, a really good one. So, in this artist view of, uh, of the system, we have the photonic integrity circuit and the, and the electronics uh, in this image. In this case, they are on board. How uh, is uh, our real circuit and real implementation? Well, on the early days, uh, we employed uh, a lab equipment with a multi-channel current source that was huge. It was like operating a 10 by 10 millimeter uh, photonic integrity circuit with a full uh, rack 
of multi-current uh, electronic sources. But since, since then, um, we saw that um, in order to provide the scalability, even uh, there are no lab equipment that allows us to program a lot of uh, phase actuators. So uh, in order to solve that, and also because we wanted to bring this to the market, we need to go through a miniaturization process. So in this case, we have developed our own current multi-channel current sources. At the moment, they are outside the photonic integrated circuit. That means that our, um, the control unit is on a board, and then this board is connected to the, um, to the unit where we have the, the photonic integrated circuit. The, um, the expectations for the future are uh, that things will be getting closer and closer and also uh, more uh, miniaturized. So at the moment they are um, disaggregated element, but uh, still some research should be done on that direction. I, I will say as well that um, uh, there are already uh, demonstrations of co-integration of electronics and photonics, also of large scale circuits integrating the drivers together with the photonics. But uh, it's something that, uh, at least from my, from my point of view, the, um, the field is complex enough <laughs> to avoid to, to having more problems than, than the ones that we need to solve. So um, I think that um, it will be an important step, the co-integration of electronics and photonics, but it's not an essential step that needs to happen right now. It, it, it will come for sure. One is a slightly non-technical question. When is the go-to market for the, the products from Iphronics plant? Mm -hmm. Okay, good question. So at the moment at Iphronics, we have already developed a, a minimum viable product that um, we are we est we have started uh, this month to offer it to our clients. Uh, indeed, I, I was referring here to the beta testing program that basically uh, we have uh, started it uh, in this quarter. There are several companies, international companies around the world, uh, most of them in the aerospatial um, field, in signal processing, also some research institutes that are getting access to our software design kits. So they have access to our photonics integrity circuit simulator, to some of the routines that we have, optical filter toolbox, uh, optical computing toolboxes, and so on. So that is already in, in, in under test by several companies. And then we are bringing them access as well to our equipment. Some of them are cloud-based, so through the lab, but also we are sending the first MVPs uh, this quarter in 2022. So, Yes, uh, in the in the year that we are about to start, uh, we are we are on that phase at the moment. Um, the next question is uh, about the different types of meshing that you showed. Uh, is a pentagonal mesh mesh design possible? Would it be less compact in comparison to the hexagonal meshes? Okay, so if I understood the question properly, is that is the mesh? So what, what are the drawbacks? Uh, if the mesh, uh, instead of having six sides, if you make it a pentagon, the five sides, is that better or worse? Yeah, so um, uh, among the, the, the ones that we have uh, yeah. provided to, to, to different papers, um, we have uh, also studied more uh, configurations beyond the hexagonal, the triangular, and the square. And we, we found that they were adding like overheads, but not providing the key differentiations or additional solutions. Like for example, in this case, our key parameter is the resolution. As, as we saw previously, the way we program circuits is just by discretizing the mesh through this programmable unit cells. So for example, if you want to create a ring resonator, or a, let's say a maximum interferometer, you have here the input capper, the output capper, this is the short arm, and for example, the long arm. But um, in this case, the resolution is, is two because it's four 
minus two. So the free spectral range will be the difference between four and two, and uh, it will be two. In this case, uh, with the square, for example, you have the possibility of creating a, well, uh, you will need more, more um, match center, another match center here, and then this will be the input coupler, output coupler, and this could be like short arm, and then the long arm could be implemented with more uh, cells. But even if we, if you are able to program this uh, match center interferometer, the unbalance that you can configure with this one, it's going to be zero or two or four or six or eight or 10. So it's multiple of, of two. If you want to create the same with the square one, in this case, you will get uh, an unbalance of four, eight, 12. So the resolution is uh, twice bad in this case for the configuration of match senders in the square one. We have um, used pentagons, octagons, and uh, additional uniform implementation of these uh, meshes. This was part of my of, of my thesis work, and it was like a long uh, journey through different circuit topologies and measuring the not only the resolution but also the flexibility. How many different ways do we have to perform, uh, for example, an unbalanced match sender in the hexagonal and in the square? And in the triangular, and I counted like the different possibilities on, on, on each one and traduced uh, and traduce these numbers into figures of merit. All these can be found in, in, in this Optic Express paper. Okay. And um, since then, we have tried to find more secret apologies, and it results that the hexagonal ones still is the one uh, providing the better performance. The next question is again about uh, uh, tuning the devices. Uh, you showed several ways of tuning it. Um, is uh, which is the best way? Is the heater the best way, or the ideal way to tune? Good question. Very very good question. So, as as we mentioned, the the way that we have to to program our circuits uh, can be different. We, I, I have introduced the top, top metal heater, top silicon heater. So even if we want to exploit the same effect, like in this case, the thermo optic effect, we will have alternative ways of uh, getting this effect on our circuit. So all of them has trade-offs. This is as, as everything in life. <laughs> there is nothing that is uh, the best thing for everything. So you, you always need to trade off pros and cons. If we go quickly through, the, through them, we will find that typically heaters or thermotic effect uh, has a, one thing that I found like key for the scalability of our circuits, which is it not introduce additional loss. If you have the heater element far enough from the waveguide, you will not introduce additional optical loss penalties. If we, want, if we are targeting 1,100 actuator circuits in the future, we need to make sure that we don't introduce additional loss. Even 0.2 dBs, when multiplied by 1,000, gets uh, like a, into a serious problem, okay? So that, that's why uh, that's uh, one of the most important metrics. However, the trade-off is coming with the reconfiguration speed. Typically, the reconfiguration speed of, of um, a thermoptic, it's between uh, 20 microseconds and 300 microseconds, depending on the shape of the, of, the, of the phase actuator. But it's also true that the power consumption is a metric that we want to optimize. And a state-of-the-art Phase actuate for uh, based on thermotic effect allows you to go down. Uh, at the moment, at Atronics, we are using phase actuators with 1.35 pip pi, so that milliwatts. That means that we are using 1.35 milliwatts per actuator, normally, and and that's well below the nominal state of the art. It's uh, nowadays around uh, 10 milliwatts. So that means that we can still have 1,000 heaters on 
and still have less than uh, 200 millivolts of power on the chip, which is not really a serious problem at the moment. So what, what's the temperature resolution you work with in those kind of figures? That's a good question. That that depends depends on the on the heater design. If you have a large yeah. a large actuator, then you need less temperature uh, gradient. If you want to make your phase actuator more and more and more compact, then you need to provide more heat to the unit. But it's also true that you can use techniques like, for example, under edge weight guides or isolation trenches. In this case, you are focusing all the heat produced by the heater towards the weight guide. In this case, you can optimize this trade-off between length and temperature. Question is uh, about, you looked at the basic unit as a two by two, uh, two port network. Uh, is there a benefit of doing it as a three port? That's a good question. So, yes, uh, yeah, let's say that, um, the benefits will be like the we will increase the complexity of our of our lattice. It's something that can be done, and indeed we have some already um, some ongoing and already uh, consolidated works on that. Uh, the the results that we got from that are not pointing to a huge benefit. So it's just that you get some more. Um, network complexity, but um, we did not find yet the if that provides a key uh, performance improvement when compared to the previous ones. One good thing about the two by two configuration is that if you check the um, papers on, on, on optical signal processing, or even the ones now about photonic computing, you can find that uh, with the two by two building block, you can create complex end by end functionalities. So it's from this simplicity uh, where we can the so the the whole uh, system performance comes from the cooperative behavior of really really the most simple unit cell that we can create in in photonics, which is a simple balanced match and interferometer. I think that we cannot envision nothing more simple than that. So it's one of the beauties of this, which is from very, very basic components and the aggregation of a massive force is like a country. A lot of people can make the, the system work. And, and, and this is similar. Um, and as mentioned, I, I think that there are still huge opportunities to continue exploring the different circuit topologies and also on, not only on the circuit, but also on the component. I introduced as well the dual drive directional coupler but uh, it's, it's still there are some works um, from people uh, in Europe working with the MEMS and also in, in, in North America uh, with MEMS for this kind of problem of photonic circuits. In this case, there are also some trade-offs uh, regarding the, the length of the components, the voltage required for the operation, the speed, I think, uh, is pretty similar to the one achieved by, by thermal optics. And um, they, they have really, really good isolation. So the optical crosstalk is not a problem because they are just switch and, and decouple the circuit uh, mechanically. So uh, as mentioned, there are a lot of trade-offs here. And, and a related question is what would be in, in, in the chips that you were talking about, what is the end-to-end -end insertion loss or individual device uh, insertion loss for the range of numbers? That, that's a good question. So regarding the insertion loss, uh, I think that we have introduced yes a, a graph here. So let me go. Yeah. Regarding the insertion loss uh, of the circuit, it depends on, on the on the performance that you achieve for the programmable unit cells and also non-negligible contribution that can be coming from the interconnection between the external world, like for example the fiber array and the chip. In this case, uh, typical coupling losses are around 3 dB per coupler. So that means that just getting in and out of the chip can be uh, 6 dB. In our case, at, at the products, we are working with edge coupling technology that allows us to go below the 1 dB per coupling. So let's say that we are losing 
between one and two dB, including input and output. Okay, so you already have two dB of loss, and then traveling through the circuit, if uh, if the circuit is large, uh, can introduce penalties. We can assume like a state of the art or nominal values for propagation loss uh, that we can get from multiple wafer runs. It's going to be between 1.5 and 2 dB per centimeters. But the real and key uh, contribution is coming from the insertion loss that you get from each programmable unit cell. As I mentioned before, uh, well, this, the one that we, the circuit, the hexagonal circuit that we published in 2017 on Nature Communication, it was featuring 0 0.6, 0 0.59 dB per programmable unit cell. You cannot create a large scale circuit with that because imagine that even you achieve a 0 0.5, like for example, having a programmable unit length of 600 microns and then assuming insertion loss per coupler of 0 0.2, which is state of the art, I would say that if you achieve an MMI working with that, congratulations, you are making a good work. Uh, the ones that we are using at the moment are around 0 0.12. And getting that is 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 pretty complex. Um, I mentioned MMIs because you can use directional couplers, but <clears throat> having all of them uh, at 50 50 exactly at, at the wavelength of 15 15 nanometers, that's a huge challenge. So if you want it to be as proper as possible, you might want to use multimodal interferometers. So okay, let's assume that we have 0 0.2 dB per coupler. And in and, and propagation losses of 1.5. Our programmable unit cells, because of the length of the heaters that can be, let's say, 300 microns, and the length of the MMIs, access way guides, and so on, we end up with a programmable unit cell of, say, 600 microns. In this case, we are saying that 0 0.5 dB will be coming from just from each programmable unit cell. So that means that if your circuit has, let's say, 10 programmable unit cells, so I'm crossing through 10 of them. I need to introduce additional 5 dB loss. Right. So that's a, that's a lot. And so the prospects are at the moment with our technology, um, we are working with these numbers. That means that we are introducing as well the possibility of the user to amplify the signal. But um, yeah, at the moment, let's say that the insertion loss that we want to set as a maximum, it's going to be like 10 dB. So that that's currently limit the size of, of the circuits. But uh, the direction where we are going is minimizing the insertion loss, loss of the couplers, also minim, miniaturizing the programmable unit length. So these are the numbers that we are expecting for the next uh, two, and two to three years, which is working with the numbers close to 0 0.2 dB per, per uh, programmable unit cell. So as you scale the, and as you increase the number of paths, the path length increases, the loss is going to compound. So uh, what's the plan on integrating amplifiers in these uh, chips? Yeah, that's a, a good question as well. So the plan for the integration of the amplifiers is the following. The first one, as, as, as I mentioned before, I, I try to keep it simple, always. So that means that uh, if we have the possibility, like for example, through through this, oh, let me go. Yeah. So through these um, edge couplers, if we are able to interconnect a high performance block, but that is not integrated on the chip, let's say that for example, these two outputs are going to be dedicated through the interconnection of an optical amplifier. So that means that. Anytime the user needs an amplifier, just need just need to go through these um, ports, and then these ones will interconnect it through an external cavity that will feature as an optical amplifier. In this case, if for example you are having a, an SOA of uh, 14 dB, and I mentioned before that just getting in and out of the chip is 2 uh, dB for our circuit, that means that you are getting a gain of uh, additional 12 dB. Uh, that's like earliest, early days possibilities. <laughs> oh, look, now it's working the animation. <laughs> uh, so these are uh, 
the, the possibilities that you have to interconnect the, the optical amplifier. But um, there are, I think that this, this past month in November or October, the, it was happening the first integration of um, laser and also of amplifiers that you can get access through a multiplayer wafer run. This was run by one of the speakers that you will get uh, in your seminar talks. I think that Gunter Rockles uh, was uh, listed there and he has been leading the integration of uh, indium phosphide with silicon photonics. So in the future, we might see that one of these high performance blocks is just a stamp of an SOA or, a, or an actual laser. Uh, uh, I, I hope you have time to answer a few more questions. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, great. So, um, the, what criteria are important for optimization and are there any favorite optimization approaches? Uh, I think the question is related mm -hmm. to scaling also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, a, a very good question. So, of course, I, I have my preferences, but um, let's say that uh, when dealing with optimization methods, uh, one thing that is typically said is that there is no free lunch algorithms. So it's like um, some algorithms can perform better for some applications and some algorithms will perform better for other applications. It also depends in, in, if you are working on local search algorithms, that means that you are like close to a solution. If you are not close to a solution, you might use global search algorithms. Um, let's say, for example, I introduced previously the workflow for our optical filter toolbox. In this case, we are performing a pre, a, a, a first phase where we use an analytic algorithm to find the analytic response. In this case, the, resp the variables that are resulting uh, through this methodology are putting us extremely close to the solution. So that means that in this case, it might be better to use a local search algorithm because it's like, you are pretty close. I just will just push you to the optimum point. But uh, other algorithms, like for example, the ones that we uh, publish in this uh, multipurpose self configuration of promo photonic circuits. In this case, we were just programming the circuit from scratch with known analytical method uh, a priori. So that means that you are blind in the search area. So you need to uh, to use global search algorithm. In this case, we employed like genetic algorithms, particle run optimization algorithms, and gradient free algorithms. Okay. So uh, a related question that came later is uh, how do you interpret the device non idealities while doing this optimization? Do you do it device to device or how do you provision for it? Yeah, that's a, a good uh, question. Um, in this case, our our methodology is the following: we have developed um, a, a simulator engine. I think that I have not listed here the um, the reference, but it was published in Optica in 2020, and it was called like a scalable arbitrary methods for programmable photonic integrated circuits, something like that. And, and you can find there that how we created a, the, the performance estimator. Basically, it's a, a tool that allows you to create a, a, the scattering matrix of a circuit once you provide it with the driving data. But that's too complex. And I, I can tell you that it took us more than one year to, to get that program working, and it was quite fixed. And since then, we have been improving it for more than two years. And that's it's available through our performance estimator. It's um, at the moment is we have created it. I, I think that was a, a question also that was popping up in the chat regarding what is the language that we use and so on. If we in, in this case we are using Python-like implementation, so it's object-oriented programming. And uh, in this case, you can imagine that we have an object which is the mesh, and then there is a method associated to that object that allows us to compute the scattering matrix. So this, this mesh, it also incorporates objects which are the programmable unit cells and each programmable unit cells has its own non-idealities. So 
how we incorporate these non-linearities, it's just, you can create, for example, a vector. Uh, you can say, for example, okay, the insertion laws are coming from an, um, a Gaussian distribution. So it's just with Python, you create a Gaussian distribution centered at, let's say, four, 0 0.4 dB with uh, some standard deviation. And then we, with a single line of code, we introduce this uh, vector and all this vector is transferred to the programmable unit cell. So each programmable unit cell will know what's going to be its uh, insertion loss. And exactly the same, you use the same methodology to incorporate optical crosstalk, tuning crosstalk, and anything else. That's it, it's going through the object. And then when performing the, um, the performance estimator, all that data is already there. So you get the non-idealities. Again, one more question related to the challenges. So, uh, can you please mention the challenges involved in meeting the system level performance for microwave applications FPGA when uh, compared with the plastics? So, I I don't know if I got the question properly. It's like uh, how how we, how it's compared the performance of the FPGA with the uh, as application specific right, device. Right, right, right. Yeah, so that's a, a, again a, a really good question. Um, it depends on the application. I, I like to say that um, sometimes there are applications that can only be programmed with this uh, with the programmable unit. So uh, there are some applications, like for example, let's say an arbitrary uh, waveform generator that requires a highest degree of arbitrariness for the creation of the pattern. In this case, this multiple interference tool uh, box um, is actually what I need. This will be the application specific for that functionality. But of course, uh, trying to reply to the question, let's, uh, let's focus, for example, on a microwave photonic filter, uh, a simple one. Uh, in this case, the only difference between the ASPIC and the um, and the micro and the and the programmable photonic circuit will be that the actual circuit configuration, it's uh, so the actual circuit topology is um, is already there. So in this case, either we have to program it, like for example, imagine that we want to create this uh, this uh, this double ring resonator uh, in cascade. So uh, in the case of an application specific device, we will have the modulator, we will have the field, the interconnection to the filter, we will have a photo detector. And then, okay, let's assume that the laser it, it's outside the photonic integrated circuit. In the case of the program of photonic FPGA, we have the same, the modulator, the photo detector, but the filter, either we program the mesh to create the, this filter, or you have an application in a specific, uh, uh, for example, this one, we have here a, a cascade of ring resonators through two waveguides. And then the only difference between the application specific device and the ASPIC is that we need to interconnect the access waveguide between the modulator and the, between the filter and the photo detector. It's not a waveguide, it's, it's a programmable waveguide. So in both cases, the difference is that in the programmable case, we are going to have more insertion loss because we need to cross through several uh, programmable unit cells. And uh, probably that th since in this case, these interconnected blocks in the application specific case are waveguides are passive. So we will have an extra power consumption uh, of our unit. In this case, uh, it, just putting this into numbers, um, the power consumption is something that it's it's going to be not a problem in the near future because at the mo uh, just five years ago the design that I implemented was consuming 100 more times than the ones that we have at the moment. So the decrease the de decrement it has been dramatic, and I think that this is going to be like negligible. But uh, probably the, the insertion loss is the part that is uh, the one that is more challenging. And that's why I mentioned that at the moment we are working with 0 0.5 uh, unit cells, but the plan is to, to reduce that to 0 0.1 in less than three years. 
So I, I think that that's the key difference is the, the insertion loss of one circuit when compared to the other uh, is actually the, the key differentiation. Next question is actually answered. How do you resolve issues related to fabrication errors in such a big uh, circuits? So it depends. If, if the fabrication errors are dealing with the interfaces, either you assume that you are not going to use that interface anymore, uh, but then the good thing is that you still can route your signal through the remaining ones. So that's with an application specific device, if the interface is not working, you can say bye bye to your chip, uh, you, you have to discard it. Uh, so that will be one example. Another example is, Imagine that you're working with your wave MS arrangement, and then uh, you discover that there was a fabrication error here in this uh, programmable unit cell. There is, for example, a waveguide that has a cut here, so light is not able to travel through this part without losing 30 dBs. So in this case, uh, we have a pre uh, an automated calibration routine that get all this information. And then when you ask the system to join avoid. this point at this point, it will avoid going through that element. So that's the way we can mitigate this uh, fabrication error. Okay. Any possibility of including nonlinear processes in these uh, functional devices? Yeah, actually. So these high performance blocks uh, are susceptible of being nonlinear. Non yeah. Um, and what's your comment on non-volatile phase change materials? GST-based uh, yeah. yeah, I think that there has been a lot of good works there in that uh, uh, very recently, most of them. Uh, some of them coming from the, from MIT groups and some other parts of the world. I have a, an eye on them, and my, my only comment at this moment is that I think that uh, still they are not, they do not provide continuous states, so I found, like, for example, has uh, 32 states between the zero and, and pi. So that means that still we will compromise the performance of the circuit. So the good thing is that they consume no power uh, once they have been programmed. So that's good. But still, I think that there we need them to be more. So the resolution of the configuration should improve in order to be practical enough for the incorporation on these kind of circuits. Which platform, silicon nitride or SOE, is based for programmable image Yeah, good question as well. I think that if you are targeting telecom wavelengths uh, and you are targeting scalability, you should aim for silicon photonics, SOI. Uh, silicon nitride is good for lower wavelengths and some applications as well because of the low loss and so on, but there are no too efficient tuning mechanisms in terms of footprint and power consumption trade-off in order to make that uh, reality at the moment. Uh, programming language science. Okay, for crosstalk, do you look at power sum crosstalk or channel to channel crosstalk? Sure. Yeah, so if we're talking about optical crosstalk, right. then the, the optical crosstalk that uh, we have at the moment is at the, the first one that we did was close to 25 dB. And the one that we have at the moment uh, in the lab, it's uh, better than 35 dB, which is more than enough, of, I would say. But uh, also you can use the software layer to, to improve this part. So improving the isolation between programmable circuits the software layers allows you to configure the programmable unit cells that are not being employed to just drift or to move all this cross tall or optical leakage through somewhere else in the circuit to avoid distortion. Uh, what's the operating wavelength range of your devices? So they are centered in 1550 in the C-band telecommunication range, and we are aiming for the whole uh, C-band at the moment. At the moment, we have achieved that. Uh, our future plans, it's moving through where the applications are. So LC, L1, and near future, we might believe uh, or, or think about moving to O1 as well, but no short-term plans for that. And what's the maximum number of input output ports uh, that you have done at the moment? 
So the ones that we have at the moment in the lab has 64 optical IOs. Okay. So this is 64 uh, inputs and 64 outputs. No, no, no. It's 64 ports. 64. And then, okay. uh, as you can see in the image, if they are inputs or output, it's up to you. I see. So yeah. You, yeah. you can use them for put signal in or okay. out. Uh, next. Last question you can see here is what's the target bandwidth or data rate that's expected to handle? Is it targeted for 800 gig Ethernet? Mm, good question. So at the at this moment, um, our focus on the data rate is uh, this will be provided by the modulators and the photodetectors that you have in the system. Of course. If you get the external modulation of the device and external photo detection, and you just get the signal in, perform signal processing, and get out, you can use any kind of uh, data rate uh, that you want. But if you want to generate that uh, digital signals or to photo detect that digital signals using the programmable circuit, at the moment we are working with modulators and photo detectors that works up to 35 gigahertz. And honestly, and I think that short-term plans are, is not going beyond these numbers at the moment, unless we use like parallelization. So, no plans for the 800 gigs Ethernet at the moment for this uh, solution. We are, we are, we believe that uh, that application requires an application-specific transceiver at the moment, and we are focusing on on providing additional signal processing capabilities, functions, and flexibilities to 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 different applications, not transceivers focused. I was looking at my own set of questions. Most of it is covered, but uh, you didn't talk about any polarization leakage as uh, the path increases. Any any comments on that? Polarization. <coughs> yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, regarding the polarization, the, the trials, some of the trials that I show uh, during the talk were performed with a silicon photonic chip that was employing uh, grating couplers. So the grating couplers actually filter all the TM mode and only allows the T go through the circuit. So just polarization controller that in those cases was an external one okay. uh, allows us to maximize power and thus maximize the T. Um, more. But I, I must say that the, since then we've designed, fabricate, and encapsulate edge cappers. So the ones that, uh, as I put here in the image, are based on edge cappers. And yes, that means that we need to handle the polarization. In our case, we have designed the circuit to work only for T. That means that uh, you need to have filters at the at the input ports and output ports, and they remove any kind of TM. Uh, getting into the city. Okay, so that looks like uh, what we have. And any any fundamental limit on uh, the device density or? Uh... Mm -hmm. so the fundamental physical well, limit uh, on uh, the number of devices yeah, so... cascades. Yeah. So uh, regarding the the part of the scalability. Uh, fundamental limits to make this a reality. Uh, being able to put this amount of actuators on a chip, which will uh, see this image with a smile, which is like, oh my God, we were just uh, having bad times integrating uh, 16 phase actuators. And, and now this guy is talking about 16,000 <laughs> actuators. So yes, uh, the fundamental limits that I see there is, okay, if we maintain the, the programmable unit cell that we have at the moment, we need to go through miniaturized uh, programmable unit cells. That means that typically the 3 db cutters uh, have like between 60 and 120 microns length. So we need to reduce them to the minimum, let's say five microns, uh, 3 db cutters, which is not extremely far from the state of the art. Um, regarding the phase actuators, depending on the platform that you use, typically they have like 100 microns, 300 microns, 
500 microns depends it depends on the foundry so if you really want to put like that amount of phase actuators we need to reduce and reduce the the, the footprint of these elements but uh, probably the part that um i will associate to a fundamental limit is not the the length and in the end the footprint of the heater is is large but it's really really short in the wide dimensional uh, longitude so I, I will say that the one of the key challenges is being able to put all these electrical signals out of the chip so the interfacing is one of the major bottlenecks of course there are papers from uh, mainly the, the original contributors were from north america well, I, I think that he is a, um, a guy from India, uh, uh, Reza, uh, uh, that published a paper on beamforming networks for large scale beamforming networks and uh, proposed a matrix address of uh, phase actuators. This kind of matrix address or time sharing uh, allows you to reduce the number of electrical IOs. I think that that's the, the key limit, is the electrical IOs required to drive the whole system. That's, that's, what, that's going to be one of the key fundamental limits, but it's true that that was solved already for electronics. So I, I don't see problems for making this uh, graph a reality, at least till 2030, probably. But, but at some point you make it the... Uh, Limits on mean free path of the electrons. I mean, somebody has to work out with that. I mean, how far can you keep going down? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's like probably, I, I don't know if we will see something like problems of the extreme militarization of the problem of, of the components will lead to problems that nowadays are not visible. So then it, we will need research. In order to solve problems that at the moment we we cannot even envision them, so that's that's for sure. Okay, uh, Bijoy, do you have any questions? I think some hands I see. Uh, 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 no, no, I don't have any questions. I think it's a really good talk, and uh, particularly Q and A session is. Uh, yeah, thank really... you so much for yeah, patiently yeah. answering all our yeah, questions. Yeah, 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 and uh, I think uh, it could have been uh, better also. If Deepa, you could uh, tell who is asking questions, I think that could be. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I think uh, maybe next time one more, so we should yeah, announce. So the we name had uh, questions from a lot of questions from Kumar Piyush, uh, Yashraj, Arnab Goswami, uh, Ashutosh. All these are PhD scholars, I know. PhD scholar. Uh, Tushar, uh, Pranabendu Ganguly, uh, Ian Piyush, uh, Shamsul Hassan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, I was adding my questions. Yeah, it's a very nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a uh, almost uh, we thought of uh, concluding at five o'clock, but it is exceeding five forty. So almost the same time for the Q and A. So yeah, yeah, it's a good job, uh, Deepa and uh, Daniel particularly. It's an excellent talk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, we really wish uh, that uh, sometime soon we'll be able to host you. We yeah, you yeah, sure. Person. Once the pandemic over. Actually, yes. actually, this Q&A session is very good. One of our speakers says that, uh, please extend my Q&A session instead of talking 45 minutes to the wall. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> so that's good, actually, yeah. Thank you very Thanks. much. Yeah, yeah. Thank okay, you. thank you, Deepa. Yeah. Thank, you thank, thank you for the opportunity, and, and it will be a, a pleasure to be able to visit you at any time. Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. We'll be in touch with you and we'll be just uh, looking forward for a tight collaboration in future. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you all. Thank you all, thank audience, you. for your patience present till the end. Yes. Yep. And thank you for all your questions. Very, very nice. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yep. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye.